If you have some time, I'll just show you again. Go on Pearson, go on the announcements. Pearson Rebel Survey. And you can fill this out. And you can have a chance to win a $50 Visa gift card. Um, and it's useful. I know many of you on your midterms um, and test one, you talked about how, you know, Revel was your little, your little virtual study buddy all year long. It got your back, keeping you prepped, forcing you to read, giving you little rewards. Um, some of you in the beginning, some frustrations with it, I know, because of uh, glitches and stuff, but um, be, give honest feedback. You know, they want to improve uh, things. I know some students had issues, but overall, I do think students really liked it. Um, but yeah, just uh, whatever you think, let them know. It'll be useful. Oh. All right, so week 21, we're all the way here. We are done our journey in Social AO3. You'll be absolutely done, as you'll see, um, April 18th. So, you know, less than, less than three weeks. Um, and, you know, what better way to end the class than on April Fool's Day, right? So, you can expect something weird, although everything's always a little bit off in this class, on my regard, I'm sure. But today, something, there'll be something, so look out for it. Um, but I'm not going to do anything nasty, don't worry. So uh, it'll, it'll, be, it'll be, like, funny, hopefully. Maybe not funny, but, but not evil. Um, OK, so we end the course um, today. And so a few things. Um, so thank you. The attendance is better today. And you know, uh, attendance is fine. I know we have web option. And uh, my, I don't, I'm happy to see people in person. Um, but as long as you are engaging with the course material, uh, then I'm happy. Um, so I'll have a question about that later on Mentimeter, just like your overall um, impression of web option. Uh, it's my first time using it. And I've got a lot of good uh, responses from people saying it's helped them. Uh, so uh, I'll just have a question about that later. Um, but so today we have our last lecture. I'll give, over, I'll give some final exam tips. Um, and then in our like, last, I want to make it our last hour and a half. Uh, so people wanted more time for the, for the fun part and the study guide. Um, so I've tried to merge a lot of things together. I'll have things you can do at home, things you can do in tutorial, things you can do by, by yourself. Um, so today I'm going to kind of show you what all those things are. Um, but it's our last lecture, so we also have to do that. So it's a pretty packed day, but anyway, the order of it will be I will try to get through the lecture relatively quickly to spend more time on the final exam, since this is only one uh, week out of everything that's testable. Um, and this week, just as a note, um, there aren't going to be a ton of questions on this final week because I know it's a bit crammed. Um, so the things that I cover in lecture for this week should be what your focus should be on. Um, you don't have to you know, mine every little bit of, of this chapter, I would say. Uh, so you'll see with the tips that I give, uh, this week I'm going to try to be a little bit more direct in terms of what you should be studying. Uh, the final exam is cumulative, so you have to study everything. But really read with an eye to major themes. Um, and that will make sense when you see the study guides, uh, both the video one um, and the, the Kahoot one that uh, I've made. So anyway, oh, they locked me out. Oh, I locked myself out. Give me a little clicker. Um, so again, double-edged sword. Today's the last day if you're in this class. But hopefully, it's the last day of the beginning of your sociological journeys. I hope I've converted some of you into sociologists. And if not by now, then hopefully uh, by the end of the lecture. Okay. Ooh, okay. So this week we end on challenges to the global environment. So as sociologists, budding early learning sociologists, we've been looking at everything social. So this week I'm going to try to draw a lot of things together. Imagine everything's the exam preparation. Oh, that's not really very visible. It's too bright. Um, Imagine this course. You were introduced to the ideas of the sociological imagination and the sociological perspective. Seeing how social institutions shape our lives. Oh, gosh. I can't see anything. 
OK, that should be a bit easier to see, right? Yes, it, it works. I got an environmental one. Um, so we've been looking at everything social, seeing how the things we take for granted, um, our habituated tendencies, are shaped by our local environments. The elephant in the room, sort of, this, thus far, has been um, that we really have not focused on the environment itself. So I think that's why now um, there's, and, and it's been a growing tendency um, among, in social sciences more generally, in intro courses and textbooks, um, to end off with this question of the environment. Um, because, you know, as much as, we, as much as social issues are important, obviously, studying race, class, gender, and inequalities, the emphases of this class, seeing the broader context of the natural environment and how we are just ultimately one organism of many, um, th that's very important to think about. Uh, we, we, particularly since we see modern sociology as we know it and as we've discussed it in this class, uh, was in dialogue with the Industrial Revolution, which many would argue was set off the beginning of a huge chain of bad events for the natural environment. I um, mean, we're in this time now, think of the Green New Deal, kind of that people are thinking about in America, um, global warming, climate change. There's a lot going on in terms of these questions. Um, so sociologists are interested in this, but you know, echoing wider society and th the world around us, we are relatively new uh, in terms of asking these questions. Um, and as we'll see, the study of the environment necessitates interdisciplinary work, drawing on the work of biologists, um, even geneticists, seeing, you know, how, how, humans, uh, how human evolution is linked to environmental adaptations, good things and bad things we've done to the environment. Um, this is a very exciting time to study the environment um, and again, that's why the course ends on this. Um, it also comes after the social movements week uh, and the globalization week because we are in a time right now uh, of a, uh, a major social movement of seeing humans as part of a deeper ecology. Um, and that's kind of the, uh, our, our bigger ecosystem beyond just humans, uh, where humans are not center stage necessarily. Um, so that's the final theory we'll end with. Um, so what is environmental sociology? So essentially, okay, it follows everything else that we've covered in sociology. It's the study of society and people. But in this case, it's how all of us, almost in like a functionalist sense, you know, functionalists were often criticized for kind of lumping everyone together. Environmental sociology looks at everyone and their, our interaction with the natural environment. Um, so rather than looking necessarily at things like inequality, the fir which, which they do do, and we'll get to that with things like ecofeminism and environmental racism, the first research question guiding all of that is what is our relationship with the natural environment? Um, so much like the Globalization Week and the Social Movement Week, you can see this week as kind of a meta week. Remember I, I said meta as it's a, pr a week studying processes that can apply to any other week. Um, so. Again, very basic definition, how do we relate with the environment? As I said, this is a relatively recent intervention uh, among sociologists or in sociology, starting in the 1970s. Again, between 1950 and 1990, in the contemporary West at least, there were a whole bunch of social movements. Um, so this is, you know, think of the civil rights movement, multiple feminist movements, um, Stonewall, the LGBTQ movements, uh, gay liberation, all of these kind of social justice efforts uh, also had much to do with the environment. Um, essentially critiques of kind of contemporary capitalist society as exploiting not just certain marginalized individuals, um, but really echoing the work of scholars and activists that were critical of the treatment of indigenous populations. Also seeing how we've kind of been, dis did, uh, many of the processes of exploitation that people were suffering uh, from or experiencing um, animals and members of the environment, uh, members of the environment, what am I saying? The, the, the natural environment, uh, we're also suffering. Um, so this was a wide time of a lot of social tumult and change. Um, and, and again, the broader critique, as we saw with post-structuralism and conflict theory, of people starting to question all of the progress. Um, that, you know, as we'll see, the, the social dominant narrative uh, of uh, kind of Western progress, um, people critiquing this in this moment. Um, so 
sociology has kind of a natural affinity with these sort of critiques in that, as we'll see, all of the major approaches to viewing the environment as a sociologist make us take one step further or, or lead us one step out of everything we've studied so far and ask, okay, yes, as a human species, we have all these divisions between us. We have to see how different historical events and socially constructed things influence our lives. But going one step outside of ourselves as a species, how have these things also influenced the natural environment? And how has the natural environment played a role in this process? Um, again, these questions are not entirely new. Um, Comte, Durkheim, uh, Parsons, kind of the key functionalists, they all were, in, you know, were interested in technologies and, and technologies as basically being humans, um, humans' ways of harnessing the natural environment. Uh, and, they, and they saw that as a, a good thing, leading towards rationalization and positivism, whereas conflict theorists saw that as inherently exploitative and, and kind of bad. Um, but so we've always grappled with these sort of questions of dealing with the environment, but the central difference between environmental sociology and classical sociology is really the centering of humans in this process. Um, so rather than just see, again, the environment as kind of impacting or being impacted by us, here it's, you know, to what extent could we actually imagine a future where humans are seen as, a broader, as, as part of a broader ecosystem rather than just using nature? What would a world look like if we had a more equitable relationship with nature? Um, again, these questions can seem kind of strange because nature is not, you know, we're so used to just thinking about humans. Um, but basically here we're ending the class with an expansion of scope. What would a sociological imagination look like if we viewed the natural environment, which any environmentalist in the room would probably view it as, um, as an equal partner rather than as a resource? So again, a lot of changes in semantics and language. Um, so as I said, this is key uh, in, in, a broad, in, in also a bigger movement in academia towards interdisciplinary research. Um, so seeing, you know, sociologists are also in an interesting time because um, if you, you know, when you, when you get in upper years in, in university, you'll see this too. Um, there are new areas emerging. Uh, by, of, uh, there's one called biological sociology. Um, there's population genetics, epidemiology. There are many new kind of hybrid disciplines um, that take this environmental approach of, again, decentering humans and seeing, you know, to what extent are we evolved, to what extent are we hindering the environment, to what extent is the environment, uh, do different environments like different climates trigger different latent genes in us? Um, all these sorts of questions uh, that really uh, focus on the exploitation of the environment and, and seeing the environment as an equal partner all of those questions tie into another bigger movement that's happening again of, of disciplines starting to move out of um, what are often called silos or like separate bundles into a broader uh, field. Uh, and again, of uh, biosocial things. Um, so in order to understand how humans are part of a deep ecology, again, I kind of, the theory we'll kind of end with, um, in order to understand that, we need more robust understandings of, you know, to what extent does the environment shape us as individuals, and to what extent do we shape the environment around us? Um, and we need to do biological testing to answer those things. And we can't find out things about the environment through things like surveys. We can only find out what people think about the environment <laughs> through, through that, because we're not going to, I can't interview a tree. I can interview a tree hugger, but not a tree. Um, hippies in the room will know, will know, get that reference. Um, and so again, in sociology, as much as we are moving towards interdisciplinary work, um, given the tools we've learned, mostly uh, what we can study with things like surveys and ethnographies, participant observation, all of the tools we've discussed throughout the term, what, what an environmental sociologist um, would be more influ would be uh, more excited about or ready to do research on, is how things like norms, values, beliefs, customs how these impact the environment. Um, so again, to what extent does living in a capitalist society versus a socialist one shape the environment? To what extent does embracing, say, hegemonic masculinity and like being tough and earning a lot of money and being independent, does that have any impact on the environment? Would that lead people to want to make, you know, um, uh, institutions where you can make a lot of money and you disregard the environment? 
Uh, we'll see that with eco-feminists who say um, women are also are often seen as quote unquote more natural and lumped in with nature. Uh, would would a society that was more predominantly matriarchal have a better relationship with the environment? Uh, would they be more nurturing of it using those stereotypes? Um, all of these are questions uh, again that people have uh, philosophized about. Um, so ultimately, again, environmental sociology is two partners, humans, and the physical environment. And again, the physical environment is something we have not talked about at length in this course. We've often used examples and things, usually of, of again, certain areas being marginalized or exploited. Um, but now we're elevating that conversation. Um, again, those were all, I'm not, you know, I'm not demonizing the work we've done so far, um, but we were not really framing the environment as an equal partner. Um, so, there are three ways historically, sorry, I should have bolded those other words. Um, the things in brackets are kind of the schools. Um, so there are three approaches to analyzing, on the left-hand side, the relationship between humans and their physical environment um, as analyzed by environmental sociologists. So again, sociologists have kind of categorized what are the popular discourses of talking about this relationship. So as we'll see, there's a scientific approach, um, the deep ecological approach, or more mystical, um, in that Weberian sense, um, or the more sustainable development approach. Um, so the scientific approach is that we'll see it's very linked to the, um, to the, the kind of uh, linked to the whole modernization thesis that we live in an environment that's full of resources, and as our technologies become more sophisticated, we develop more means of harnessing and exploiting and using those resources. Um, so this is seen as scientific or economic. So again, uh, just as the critique of kind of contemporary society is that you know, we're in a time crunch, um, we have to exchange our time in, in the form of labor for money, a kind of classic Marxist labor theory of value. Um, here, the environment is simply seen as a warehouse. Um, so what can I get out of it? Um, and that leads uh, people to say, okay, you know, maybe I shouldn't damage the environment, I shouldn't do things like flash fires or cause droughts, um, but not because the environment is intrinsically valuable, but because it's a resource. And if I like, destroy the resource, then I won't have the resources anymore. Um, so this is seen as a kind of amoral or even immoral view um, of, of nature. It's simply you know, inanimate. I mean, it might be living, but it's not living like a human. Um, so people often uh, will, again, what can I get out of these resources? Can I get oil? Um, can I get fossil fuels? Can I extract? What can I get from this? Water. Um, on the flip side of that is the sustainable development, which, so if that is all the way on the left side, I mean, not politically, but just the spectrum, um, if that is all the way on one side with individuals viewing this as an economic relationship, again, human-centered economic approach to the environment, then a utopian, radical, utopia means like ideal, so a utopia is like a perfect state. Uh, what, what is your, you know, what's your perfect classroom? What's a socio three utopia? What would it have? Um, so, what could it ever be? Um, so the, this is sustainable development. Um, so this is that, rather than having an, a relationship based on scarcity and resource extraction and notions of economy, we base things on equity. Um, and so here, the, we'll see with sustainable, de sustainable development, the idea is humans and nature do not have to be in this opposed, top-down, hierarchical relationship. Um, and we'll see this with the, with the idea of ecological modernization, um, that, that actually, the better we treat the environment, the better the environment will treat us. Um, so things like, um, you know, a lot of health issues that people face, um, people that, that study sustainable development would say a lot, of, a lot of the diseases we experience in high rates in more industrialized countries are a product of like, things like the pollution we create um, and stress, uh, uh, you know, occup having 60-hour work weeks, having multiple careers, all of these things which also cause people you know, to drive around and create fuel, uh, create gases, uh, destroying the ozone layer. These things are interconnected. Um, so sustainable development says, okay, we don't have to totally change everything we're doing, but if we switch from a view 
of resource extraction to more mobilizing resources that exist and fostering you know, the development of parks, the development of sustainable agriculture, removal of pesticides, things that are easier on the environment, it may also help us be easier on ourselves. Uh, and we can have more of a dialogue between these two living fields. Um, and then one step further, so it's kind of in the middle, um, but because it has assumptions of both, but deep ecology, as we'll see, is, you know, as much as sustainable development, sustainable development um, is good in kind of switching the narrative from a top-down, human-centered, kind of human extracting from nature perspective, sustainable development is still ultimately really human-centered. It's still about how can we maximize this relationship. Deep ecology goes one step further, um, and this recognizes uh, many other um, cultures and religions that see, you know, nature is more than even an equal place. We come from nature. Um, so nature here, uh, the, the situation is more reversed. Uh, we're one organism, as I said in the beginning, we're one species of many. Um, and sustainable development is, you know, it's on the way towards this sort of thinking. Um, but the question that kind of deep ecology asks is, um, what would it look like if you not only decentered humans from kind of being at the center of this, but actually equalized them with every other sort of thing on the world or on the planet? What if you really just saw us as one evolved species out of everything else? Um, you know, so again, it's in terms of a hierarchy, you have the economic theory, where it's human using the environment. Then you have sustainable development, where it's humans and the environment in this equi equitable relationship. Deep ecology is then, well, let's go one level further and then see humans as on the same plane as everything else uh, that's in, on the planet. And again, that's why it can be seen as the most kind of radical, as we'll see. Um, but again, this week is not, again, it's, we're throwing a lot of new things. But what I just want you to do is using your sociological imagination, think, you know, what kind of theories and voices might maybe deep ecology be linked with? Um, who would support views like that? Um, who would want that, those sorts of views to be more silenced or marginal? Um, you, you should have some ideas about these things. You don't have to answer these things, but um, it's more just things to think about. Um, you know, A, how would a sociologist approach these sorts of issues? Well, we would look at how different social formations impact the environment, um, but we'll also see there's a big gender and race component, too, and cultural component um, in that very many non-Western uh, cultures historically have had a more deep ecological perspective, uh, which didn't really fit the idea of Western rational progress um, in, in many, as, was, as Max Weber pointed out really well. Um, so the new environmental paradigm is, uh, we'll see, so we'll, we'll see here, again, a big distinction between environmental and ecological. Um, so I'll explain that. So the new environmental paradigm, which has been going on, uh, you know, for the last few decades, it essentially, again, is, can, is starting to recognize um, that human, humans and nature have a reciprocal or two-way relationship. The things that we do, even when we don't think about it, inherently impact the environment. Um, so the kind of work that we do, having a university like this, building sidewalks, streets, clothes, everything we take for granted, food, um, all of this is impacting the environment. So the new environmental paradigm, again, is kind of phase one. Seeing that, oh, our environment, or sorry, um, our behavior is actually part of a larger ecosystem that has its own limits and processes going on. Uh, so we're sharing the world with plants, rocks, you know, geoformations, soil, um, and animals. We're sharing this planet with other things. Um, and our behavior is part of that. Now the new ecological paradigm goes one step further again. Um, so for the purpose of this course, view it as a timeline, right? So we have sociology looking at humans and our social formations. Then the new environmental paradigm starts to really emphasize the physical environment. And then the ecological paradigm says, OK, your insights about us being part of this bigger um, environment, they even use the word ecology, um, we now should be going one step further and really seeing how we fit this ecology. 
Um, so this goes um, back to that time. So here, your, little, your worlds will be all rocked, and you'll see, and, and I'll have another further justification for why I always talk about the Industrial Revolution. Here, the new ecological paradigm goes all the way back to that big time of tumult. Uh, remember the period of the Enlightenment, um, the beginning of industrialization, people moving from, I say it so many times, the self-subsisting farms uh, to, to uh, cities, factories. And they say, well, modern industrial society as we know it, really starting in that time, is beginning to go beyond the limits of our environment. So again, remember, new environmental paradigm said, we are living in an ecosystem that has its own, not only processes, but limits. So the e ecological paradigm is really focused on that last part of saying, okay, you've identified that it has limits. You haven't really explained it that much. This is why we need biologists and people from other fields to really see, okay, it's one thing to say, you know, are humans creating pollution more in X society than Y society? Um, uh, but now we really need to probe into that. Um, so this gives rise from, instead of having a view that's human-centered, we have a view that's ecology-centered. Again, sociological imagination. What if we imagined that our environment was actually being privileged more than us? Which, again, is, is a very radical view. It's a thought experiment. So humans are only one part of the global ecosystem. We flatten us with everything else. What if we just imagined in a thought experiment that we were no different from, I mean, different physically and whatever, but morally or in terms of, you know, hierarchy and, and value and prestige, what if we were no different than ants or dogs or horses or plants even? Um, so does anyone know what the opposite of an ecocentric view is in the human environment relationship? So ecocentric is ecology centered. What's human centered called? Does anyone know? Yep. Yes. So using your linguistic imagination, why, does it, why is it anthropocentric? What's that word mean? Exactly, right? Isn't, isn't like university so easy with words like that? So I like words like that. They make me feel smart. Oh, anthro. I know that means human. And you can guess androcentric is male-centric, right? And gynocentric is women-centered. So all these words. Oh, that's why a gynecologist is called that, right? See? Exactly. Everything. And then you just go, 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 right? So anyway, um, so the, here, again, radical shift. From a Western perspective, many other cultures, many indigenous, uh, many, many tribes around the world, they take ecocentric eco views. Remember animism that we learned with Tyler. Uh, animism was starting that we live in this enchanted environment. Um, the history of Western progress, as we've seen in the last 200 years at least, uh, was rationalizing that away, getting rid of those mystical religious explanations. Eco, uh, the deep ecology, as we'll see, and the ecological perspective ask the question of, are these things really religious? Could this not be scientific? So again, a radical reframing of, of now using contemporary insights in biology, population epidemiology, health studies, of saying maybe all of those cultures, marginalized viewpoints, they weren't just myst quote unquote mystical or religious, but they were actually tapping into a scientific truth um, that we've been focusing too much on humans and doing this is actually going to hurt our species. Uh, so that's when you see a lot of the criticisms of things like global, global warming, climate change, and environmental degradation. It's saying, again, not just equitable partners, but saying we are just one of many, many things. Um, so the triple bottom line uh, comes out of this view, too. So any endeavor that you do. So here, a company's balance sheet. So think of accounting. The triple bottom line is anything you're doing. And think of it, you know, uh, the things like effective altruism, uh, it's a big charity foundation where, you know, it kind of dissects uh, how much, you know, uh, let's say you're donating to a charity. Um, there, are these comp there are these organizations, not-for-profit, like effective altruism, um, that try to count exactly how efficient charities are. Um, so there's a whole, I won't get super into that, that's beyond this course. But again, there's a movement going on of trying to see how can humans best impact the environment. So there's been a focus on minimizing our harm, but how can we actually improve the environment? Um, so the triple bottom line says every kind of company, everything you do, you should be thinking of three things. Um, so if it's economic, yes, you have to consider profit. 
I mean, even in terms of your own personal life, obviously you want to do things that benefit you on some level or benefit someone else. So there's always going to be a question of profit. The environmentalists are not saying, okay, no, everything has to be um, completely altruistic or you have to throw that out. That's not sustainable, right? The idea of sustainable development is um, you can incorporate discussions of the environment uh, while still doing business. So profit is still important. Um, people are still important. So even though you are, uh, you know, even if you take an ecocentric view, there's one thing to say in a thought experiment, or humans, you know, humans are really ultimately no, not that different from other things. Um, we're still humans, and you know, we're still going to obviously prioritize what we're doing. That's, you know, I don't know when that ever wouldn't happen. Um, but anytime we think about profit and people, we have to consider the planet. So again, people of this perspective see, you know, let's just raise the question of saying, why have we been seeing ourselves as so special? Maybe we are special, but by virtue of our specialness, we've done a lot of damage to the environment, and we've marginalized a lot of other views that maybe we're on to something. Um, so by including the discussion of the planet, basically in anything else, uh, it forces us to always say, OK, what damage are we doing? How can we improve this relationship? And in turn, how can this come to help us? So in a kind of colloquial way, um, these, new eco those, these new ecologists um, they're saying, you know, we've been biting the hand that feeds us for a long time. Focusing just on social structures, that's great. That's why sociology was needed. Um, but we now need to see that there's a broader natural structure around us. Um, so just to see if we're all on the same page, true or false? Um, so do you think if, if you so do you think this is true? Environmental sociologists apply biological insights to understanding the relationship between humans and their natural environment. So do you think this is true? Do you think it's false? Why is no one raising their hands? It's true. Yes, okay. Again, maybe it's because I said they're not quite there yet. Um, but environmental sociologists, okay, so to put it, those of you that participated, um, well, I, I get it, you're all saving your energy for Kahoot. You think it's a finite resource and I'm trying to extract it from you. Um, no, but okay, so environmental sociologists, again, what makes this exciting is it is, and, and why we end the course with this, for a few reasons. A, because we're expanding the scope of our sociological imagination to things beyond just humans. This is the first time we do that. Um, and B, that it necessitates other fields uh, to help us do this. Namely, we have to really um, take into account the development of biological sciences. Um, so I know many of you are taking life sciences um, or planning on going into life sciences, and sociology is more an elective. Um, so for all of you, this is a way to you know, get you thinking that you can still take sociology courses um, and, and put that in into what you're doing. So I'll do a few more slides, and then we'll take a 10-minute break. Um, again, the lecture will be I'm aiming to end. I uh, can't believe it. Only, only 40 more minutes of me blabbing away, and then it's done forever with, with Soche 03. I can't believe it. I'm, 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 I don't, I'm out of myself. I'm out of my head. Um, OK. So environmental mental challenges. So all social changes, again, come as a response to something, right? Um, civil rights movement. Feminist movement, um, indigenous movements, people, you know, uh, the, the hot button social issues we're, we're facing now. People have increasingly been realizing that humans have caused uh, very many natural disasters. But increasingly, we've been drawing a distinction between natural disasters and technological disasters. So, you know, without a whole lot of scientific inquiry, people may have just viewed natural disasters as well natural not the product of human intervention. We've increasingly been learning, though, that many of the quote-unquote natural disasters are actually a product of deeper technological disasters. So what that means, ultimately, is that by privileging humans and the impact that technologies have on us, we have, you know, not, not necessarily in some like horrible anti-environmentalist way been saying, OK, how can I get the most while damaging the environment the most? That's not necessarily what most people were thinking. But many people, many people did do that, 
But overall, the big process was we were only really focused on the impact that technologies had on us. We weren't really imagining the impact on the environment. Or if we were, we were often kind of forgetting about those, those musings. Um, so Ulrich Beck says uh, we, can, we can kind of categorize our contemporary society as a risk society and see that all of the technologies that we have bear the potential for risking both our environments and our longevity as a species due to unintended consequences of these technologies, impacts that these have on the environments that we're only starting to, to slowly realize. Um, and the product of this, or, or sorry, the reason for this is, you know, when Marx was writing roughly, you know, 200 years ago or 150 years ago, when he was writing, he was looking at modes of production that were uh, geographically based, like geographically limited. Uh, we now have technologies that influence the entire globe. Uh, so again, things that go on in one country um, can have impacts. I mean, this was always the case, but increasingly so. Uh, air pollution, um, you know, water pollution, all sorts of things that we're doing now uh, are creating impacts not only on the local geographies, but on a global scale. Um, so basically the process is, remember, we, we discussed the process of industrialization and post-industrialization uh, being around technological development. And as technology becomes more sophisticated, um, cult cultures and societies become more allegedly sophisticated. The argument in terms of the environment is the more sophisticated the technology, the more potential there is for environmental damage. Now, the deep ecologists, as we'll see though, they would argue also, as we'll see, um, that the, the more complex and sophisticated the technologies become, the more opportunity there is perhaps for also seeing how we can um, rein in the damage we're doing. But again, just not, not to put the cart before the horse, in terms of environmental challenges, um, multiple disasters, and right now, thinking just about water shortages and global warming, probably two of the biggest ones, um, those have forced people um, in the academy and beyond to really step back and say, whoa, what are we doing to the environment? Even if you're taking a human-centered view, even from that view, you have to take the environment seriously now because of all the natural disasters that you're realizing are actually technologically influenced um, that are happening. Um, so again, the, the emphasis that people are seeing when you're seeing people discussing the environment and climate change, it's not so much thinking, whoa, you know, why are these natural disasters happening? The consensus that has increasingly been uh, being reached is that the bulk of these disasters, or increasing numbers of these disasters at least, are actually the latent effect of technological development. Um, so again, developments in industry that had the manifest function in a Mertonian way. Um, so let's say, you know, I'm developing a factory to centralize labor to make it more efficient. That's my manifest function. One of the latent functions, as we discussed, was inequality and, and you know, the separation of the spheres for men and women and racialization's impact in that um, and, and all sorts of human inequality. But another latent effect that we're discussing now um, is environmental damage and degradation. Um, so humans have experience dealing with natural disasters, things like volcanoes and tsunamis, um, but we have little experience dealing with technological disasters. So climate change, oil spills, even things like air, airplane crashes. Those are not natural. Um, that is a completely technological disaster. Uh, it is, think of the recent one um, with, with the uh, Ethiopian Airlines, I believe. Uh, and that was devastating. And there uh, you know, people from all around the world killed in that crash. Um, and that is one example of technology going awry, a little bit different than what we were discussing, because uh, it's not the impact on the environment necessarily, um, but that's still an offshoot of our technology. Um, so technological disasters, again, they can be more like purely technological, like an airplane crash, but they can be things like climate change, where um, you know, climate change can cause natural disasters, icebergs you know, ripping off of, of areas, um, and you know, uh, animal extinctions in climates that have quickly changed. Um, but ultimately, the discussion is that technology adds another risk in our society, um, and we need to take that seriously. Um, so let me see, just for time. Yeah. See, so today was short. I'm not, I'm not joking. So 
Um, we'll take a 10-minute break uh, when we come back. So it's exactly, it's two to three. Um, in the 10-minute break, if you haven't done it already, you can do your little Pearson Revel quiz. Um, and, you know, as per request to, I don't have any study buddy questions this week because I know you're all, you're all really excited to do Kahoot, um, which I, I caved and I'm doing Kahoot. I didn't cave, I want to do it. Um, but so we just have a few slides left and then it's fun time. So please stick around. There also, there's a lot of reveals coming up too, so um, it'll be good. So sad. I know. Okay. So that was your your last ten minute lecture break in Socio three. Sad, sad times. Um, I have good news. I have good newses though afterwards though. So uh, newses, words I'm making up. Um, okay. So one of seven. So big things. So. Now we've, okay, so the, again, this, this week, only a few questions on the test about this. It's a big week just to get your thoughts uh, spinning. Again, uh, the, your, your ideas spinning about this. The big focus will more be on, you know, what does it mean to think ecologically? Um, so, so no big surprises on the, on the test uh, about this week, really. Um, just to get you excited about thinking, you know, part of my intention with this week, too, is to bridge... Uh, to keep you using that sociological imagination in other courses. Um, so even things that don't seem directly about humans always ask, you know, wow, when I'm studying psychology, um, how might I approach this as a sociologist? When I'm studying biology, how might I approach this? Um, because as, as Lawrence um, said in the last class, uh, everything's sociological, even, even the environment. Um, so now we'll just go through uh, some, of the some of the paradigms of, of studying, um, again, the environment. And now looking at it, again, um, as the environment in terms of an ecology, uh, that we are one, one, one of many things. Um, so the core environmental paradigms, as we'll see, um, can be broken up into broadly, I mean, there's tons of paradigms, but the two that I think uh, are the most central in terms of, again, my, my famous binaries of having you know, one against the other, like functionalism and conflict theory. Um, are the dominant social paradigm and then the alternative environmental paradigm. And we'll see the alternative en environmental paradigm, its key feature is sustainable development. Um, so again, this is still very important, focused on the environment, not on that radical notion of ecology quite yet. We're still, we're going to get there. Um, so when looking at the environment, again, either you see one that is hu uh, human-centered, so based on roughly on our ideas about capitalism. Um, so here, uh, this is thinking that um, the economic, the, uh, as society grows, yes, there may be some environmental harm as a byproduct of our factories, of our schools, of our hospitals even, but um, we will figure out the problems. We will figure out how to minimize the waste that we emit. So that's kind of the dominant social paradigm. Again, economic growth and large cities are good, and then the environmental harm is secondary. We'll figure it out somehow. So we just keep sidelining those questions. Now, the alternative environmental paradigm challenges this. It says, you know, not only are you marginalizing the environment quite explicitly, um, but you are privileging certain kinds of social orders that inherently are actually much more environmentally friendly. Um, so, you know, the idea of having huge centralized uh, labor places, so labor, uh, places like factories um, and huge skyscraper office buildings, um, you know, maybe the fact that those are bad for the environment signals that other modes of production and other modes of bringing people together may actually be better, not just for the environment, but for humans too. Um, so the alternative environmental paradigm says, you know, maybe we should learn from the damage we're doing to the environment and say, actually, we're damaging ourselves. This isn't sustainable for the environment. And look at stress levels, look at mental health problems, look at uh, inequality. All of these things are coming out of our development. Um, so maybe the environment is kind of giving us a signal. Uh, the fact that it's dying, um, maybe there are things, you know, that, would, that wouldn't just improve the environment in changes that we've made. 
Um, but it's more saying the whole history of, of the development of, of choosing to have, you know, uh, areas of high inequality, um, this has been bad for the environment and it's been bad for humans in many ways too. Um, and so here, thinking of societies, uh, so think of even um, Edward Said and his discussion of Orientalism. Uh, so remember that concept uh, linked to, to uh, the study of post-colonialism. Um, it very much emphasized that, you know, uh, throughout Western history, we've privileged things that were quote-unquote rational. Um, and rationalization, again, was seen as very removed from the environment, with humans um, as controlling the environment. So the, the alternative environmental paradigm says, let's look at how other cultures have been dealing with the environment. Maybe the fact that they're less quote-unquote sophisticated, uh, some of them in terms of their like um, capitalist structures, so uh, workplaces and education structures, maybe they have less of that developed because they're actually privileging the environment and maybe in a way we could learn from. Um, and again, there's been lots of movements that way. Even think of like the spread of yoga and minimalist living. Um, th there's been a lot of uh, social movements more around, again, treating uh, the veganism, uh, PETA, uh, all of these things of, of, of kind of respecting the environment and learning from other cultures. Um, and again, a lot of the parallels there too, uh, there's a huge uh, Buddhist influence um, of just, you know, clearing out our heads, clearing out our homes, um, and just being more one with nature um, in a lot of ways. Um, so here, again, the dominant social paradigm, human first, progress has been good, the environment secondary, we'll figure it out. Alternative environmental paradigm, no, let's recenter this, not quite at the level of ecological yet, but saying let's learn from societies that have had a more equitable re relationship with the environment, and the key for that is sustainable development. We'll still be human-centered, we're not going to go back to animism or whatever from this perspective. Again, it's not that other cultures are, but this is just saying, again, it's not quite at the, the deep ecology yet, but it's, it's a phase towards that. It's saying, okay, um, we're now equitable, and let's see what that looks like through sustainable development. So building like green business, um, leaving low carbon footprints, and doing a lot of recycling. Um, again, still human-centered, but now eco-conscious. Um, so you don't need to know all of these, so this is why the lecture comes in handy. Um, there are some, I think, I think it makes sense to differentiate these paradigms by a few measures. Um, so core values, economy, polity, meaning like the society, um, the political structure, and then society, nature, and knowledge. So I'll just compare a few of the major differences. Um, so for the dominant social paradigm, again, that's kind of environment as an afterthought. Um, the core values are material. Um, the economy is a market economy. Uh, the political sphere is highly authoritarian. Not authoritarian, author not authoritarian in like, you know, uh, you can't vote and it's not democratic, but more in that it has what are called authoritative structures. So you have experts. Um, people can vote, but they can't really change the nature of society very easily. Um, so first, the dominant social paradigm, material focused, the economy is a market economy, meaning you exchange goods in a rational way with currency, and you have experts. The environmental paradigm is more non-material. So instead of privileging economic growth, so building up you know, God's kingdom on earth, as the Puritans thought, um, instead of doing that, it's self-actualization. Again, more Buddhist influence than, say, um, you know, uh, Protestant, uh, if you want to get into East and West. Um, so more focused on self-actualization. Rather than focusing market forces and, again, having that dominance of the economy, think more broadly of public interest. What might other people want that aren't so economic? Um, and then in terms of political, um, on that same note, instead of having authoritative experts, so, you know, you, we're the Leviathan that, you, that you've asked for. We're the state. Um, having citizens and everyday workers much more involved in the government. So you're starting to see a trend. Again, this, uh, uh, the alternative environmental paradigm um, very much feeds out of many of the criticisms, say, that conflict theorists would have um, in many of the substantive issues we've, we've discussed so far in this course. Again, calling for more participation, uh, for less ethnocentrism, um, and for a more holistic uh, view of things. Um, so this is reflected, too, in the kinds of societies that are imagined and nature and knowledge more broadly. So in the dominant social paradigm, again, this is kind of like the, I guess you could say the no, the, the paradigm where the person has not taken socio-3, uh, not that people who have, that have taken, not have taken socio-3 wouldn't have taken an environmental class or something else, um, but for someone that just is, is kind of just seeing the, do, the, the more traditional 
Western way of seeing the environment as secondary. Um, the kind of society they imagine, again, is centralized. So again, cities are growing, they're becoming more cosmopolitan, rural areas are becoming more scattered and few and far between, and that can be seen as a good thing. You know, oh, people want to come together, we're developing all these technologies. Um, nature is seen as having ample reserves. Again, oh, there's all these areas we haven't yet tapped into or exploited. And then lastly, uh, we're, we're confident in science and technology. We're leaving in the environment as an afterthought, not because we're some nasty person that's trying to like cause oil spills, but we're confident that technology will outpace environmental damage. That, and that's really the central argument, not to go further, but when people argue over climate change, that's really the fault line. People that follow the dominant social paradigm, they think, mm, you know, technology's been outpacing a lot, of, a lot of problems historically, why won't it outpace the environment? Um, Alternatively, again, the alternative environmental paradigm says you've been privileging a, a centralized society, but remember, when, how, as I kept mentioning, the Industrial Revolution, for all the great things it did, you know, le lengthening lifespans on average, increasing GDP, um, it also ripped people out of their family homes um, and enforced one way of living on many people, separated spheres, um, reinforced and created a whole bunch of norms that were, were very painful for people also contributed to widening global inequality uh, in many ways. Um, similarly, so with nature, rather than seeing the world as full of resources that us industrious humans haven't figured out how to tap yet, um, they look at the resources as limited. Um, so again, we need to, we need to be more delicate um, with viewing nature. Um, and then lastly, rather than being confident in the knowledge that we've created, so going all the way back to Kant, remember, Comte said we would go from religious to metaphysical to positive. We figured it out. We have positive laws for dealing with society and nature and everything. The alternative perspective, alternative environmental, says we need to be careful because we've really been privileging certain kinds of knowledge, um, primarily in this context, Western ideas of progress. Maybe other cultures had very important things to say about the environment and our relationship here and, and the kind of long-term impacts we're doing. Um, so again, think, when you're thinking of competing social paradigms, why I liked this chart so much too is I think you could really, so as an exam tip, uh, when you're looking at any theory, think of how, you know, it would be useful to make a chart like this for, um, for, con for, functionalist, for functionalism, conflict theory, and symbolic interactionism, and try to map out what assumptions they make um, about what are their core values, how do they view the economy, how do they view political structures? How do they view society? And then maybe even nature and knowledge. Um, although those are a little bit more linked to this week. Um, but again, I want with this week you thinking, um, you know, linking everything together. Oh my god. Three, uh, we're final three. Final three! Oh. I want to prolong it, but at the same time I want to, I want to get to the game. Um, okay, so ecological modernization theory. So the alternative environmental paradigm is reinforced by a broader uh, set of theories that came out in the 1980s. So this theory is very interesting. Remember, we discussed modernization theory earlier in the course, um, and, I, and I, I believe I taught it as a mostly functionalist theory, um, that, that uh, industry is increasingly modernizing, um, and it will kind of sort itself out. Ecological modernization theory says, well, actually, you know, you can kind of see it as a functionalist theory. Um, it says, you know, maybe part of why the social dominant paradigm is as dominant as it is as it is, is because uh, over time, market societies tend to realize that the exploitation of the environment needs to be curtailed. So, for example, think of things right now um, like Whole Foods and, uh, as I said, trends in even um, organic food and anti-GMO food. Um, major kind of quote-unquote capitalist businesses have cashed in on the organic food market, right? So functionalists, if they're looking at this situation, they would say, do you really need an, al an alternative environmental paradigm when people are already um, kind of capitalizing or monopolizing on um, people, people wanting to be environmentally responsible? Um, so this is not necessarily a defense of the social dom a dominant social paradigm, but I think this is very important to see that, again, 
it, it, you, it's not, you never completely exaggerate these camps. I set them up as kind of ideal types um, of, you know, people that are not thinking about the environment um, and people that are like hyper vigilant about the environment. Um, but a more functionalist interpretation of what's going on would say catch capitalists, again, are trying to draw in all of their market. Um, so if people are becoming increasingly uh, sensitive to environmental changes, which we have been, that's why people talk about climate change, um, there are many, many things you can buy in the market uh, to reduce your carbon footprint. Um, again, your carbon footprint being your impact, uh, kind of quantified impact on the environment. Um, so in distinction to the ecological modernization theory, which essentially is saying, okay, again, maybe, um, maybe this, you know, studying the environment is a huge issue, but maybe we don't have to get too caught up with it because we're kind of tending there anyway. Ecofeminism and cultural ecofeminists say, well, <laughs> there's actually one other reason why we need to really push the study of the environment, um, and as we'll get to with deep ecology, um, see ourselves as just one species. Um, so feminist, um, it's sometimes called feminist ecology, but ecofeminism says the oppression, again, drawing analogies, the oppression of women and the destruction of the environment are two interrelated processes. Um, so ecofeminism was really a major, major thing in the 70s and 80s. Um, it was one of the key, you know, we didn't discuss it when we discussed second and third wave feminism. Um, it fit in both schools. You had a lot of white women, uh, typical, like, like stereotypical second wave feminists um, involved in this, but you also had ones from around the world, uh, more, more international, multicultural. Um, the central argument among ecofeminists was, you know, if you look at the story of, you know, quote unquote, Western progress, it very much was the development of like patriarchal industry, um, men working in, in you know, the public, in, well, the private sector, the public sphere, women at home in the private sphere, private, private space. Um, and it was like a story of conquest and domination, very male focused, androcentric. Um, and so just as nature was always seen as this, you know, resource to extract and, and exploit, uh, women historically have been seen that way um, in terms of, of humans. Um, you know, that women bear children, women stay at home with the children, uh, women are associated with emotions um, and, uh, you know, not being as quote-unquote rational and all of these things historically. Um, so ecofeminists say, we, you know, actually it's no surprise um, that you've been exploitative of women and the environment because this speaks to a broader patriarchal um, social fact. Um, so cultural ecofeminists uh, eco push this one step further. Um, so again, ecofeminists, many of them were second wave feminists, um, and they were just drawing, not just, it was an important thing, but they were primarily drawing a parallel between men's treatment of women uh, with capitalist treatment of the environment. Um, and again, capitalist, most business leaders, especially at the time of their writing, but still now, most of those being men. So they were saying these two processes are similar. Um, the exploitation is, it's, this is a masculinist thing. Um, and feminists uh, are about kind of squashing this, this real, you know, raising people's consciousness to saying, hey, uh, we live, we're living in this culture of domination. Certain people are being dominated, certain species, certain, uh, and, and humans dominating the environment. Uh, very, again, hierarchically. Um, with feminism, again, being more about sustainability and partnership and equity rather than hierarchy. Cultural uh, eco-feminists go one step further to then say, and this, this, they would kind of be like the third wave feminists. Um, again, they, they don't quite map on as easily as I'm saying, but cultural eco-feminists would then look there and say, okay, are all cultures really patriarchal in this way? Maybe there are some more equitable ones. Um, maybe different communities within patriarchal cultures, maybe some of them are being more environmentally friendly than others. Um, let's see how that fits in. Then also things like um, uh, lesbianism and other factors that are not really discussed in uh, uh, bisexuality, other things uh, that aren't discussed in pure ecofeminism where it's more um, men and women, technology, nature. Um, cultural ecofeminists is like third wave feminism by opening uh, the channels up one step further. Um, so one thing to leave you with, you know, I always, <laughs> I find, I do this all the time in my classes, I leave with some sort of like self-helpy thing, uh, but actually it's not my fault, it's the, this time it's the textbook. Um, so deep ecology, as we've introduced again, 
this, this, I don't want to confuse you too much making this an environmentalism course. Um, but So I'm just trying to put it all together. You don't have to memorize all of that. I just have it here. The final concept of this, so again, we have the social dominant paradigm, the new environmental paradigm. Both of those, ultimately, if we heed the advice, really, of ecofeminists that started this for the first time, I think, they were the biggest ones in Western culture anyway, um, deep ecology advocates personal self-realization. So yes, we can still be human-centered. We are humans. We still kind of put ourselves, you know, as individuals uh, uh, ahead of other things. Um, but we can do this through connecting. So again, this is a very feminist principle. Not dominating, not competing, but by connecting with other living things around us. And we do this by seeing the magic, you know, whether it's science, whether it's magic, whether it's religion, we do this by realizing our shared connection with our whole environments. So both human and non-human. Um, so it has four fundamental principles based on that. Again, this is, again, and, and we are in this time. I'm, you know, minimalist living, Buddhist thought, you know, think of me saying this on web option uh, 20 years from now when this is all the thing. But, um, you know, it's my moment of, of prophecy. Um, but we, we are going in that, in that way. Um, so uh, pr principle number one, all forms of life, or sorry, all life forms on Earth have intrinsic value and are being threatened by human activity. So decentering humans, thinking all of us the same plane. Again, thought experiment. Obviously, it's very hard to privilege, like, a pack of sugar over me or something. And I think, well, was this created? Is this natural? It's not about that. It's saying, <laughs> um, I'm having impacts on things I may not have imagined yet. Remember the sociological imagination. It's saying, where did people's prejudices come from? Where do their biases come from? Where, where do their privileges come from? This is just saying, let's imagine um, that I'm actually impacting all sorts of things I don't know. So it's kind of cosmic. Um, premise number two. Human life is privileged to the extent of satisfying immediate and vital needs in order to survive. So again, we're humans, and we're organisms, and we want to live. So obviously, you know, Lawrence is going to be number one when I'm imagining when I wake up and I'm hungry. It's not saying you have to marginalize all your own desires. But again, imagine how am I impacting the world around me in ways I may not know. Number three, maintaining and promoting biodiversity requires decreasing human contact in wilderness areas and increasing wilderness areas around the world. So even though I may not have the scientific knowledge necessarily to know that wilderness is good for me, um, I'm operating on the assumption that having more green space, um, having more trees, having, uh, having less damage and interfered with nature, um, more protected spaces, that those are good things. Um, and again, we're living in a context where human life is privileged. Um, you know, think of news reporting. Obviously, it's much more devastating to people uh, overall around the world when humans are killed or humans are tortured or anything than animals or plants or, or like, you know, geology. Um, and then lastly, economic, technological, and cultural change is necessary, so we need to change that social movement impetus in order to diminish the size of the human population and, by doing so, to increase the likelihood of preserving the natural environment. Now, this is the most radical one and the, and the contentious one. What of premise number four seems a bit contentious? Yep. Yeah. Right. That doesn't really sound like something you would say if you were human-centered, right? So this is, that is, you know, that's an implication of this, right? So, and this is just something to think about. Um, I know I made that look like a bad gesture. Um, but when you, this is something to think about. Um, Deep ecology and real environmental sustainability implies that we have too many humans on this planet. So then you start to think of things like one-child policies and, you know, just use your imagination. What, if we did embrace this fully, what would that look like? Um, for p seeing humans as outpacing our environment um, in some ways could lead to the development of more inequalities. Um, think historically of things, um, you know, think of um, eugenics. Uh, right, which was the weeding out of certain people. If deep ecology goes too far in that regard, um, it could also start to think, okay, there's certain populations that, have, like, uh, that are damaging the environment. That's very harsh language. Um, so again, I think giving them the benefit of the doubt, I think all this is is imagining, okay, maybe we've been growing too quickly, maybe we should stop, uh, take a step back, and say, you know, is 
reproduction, um, is it working the way we imagined? Um, in the sense that these huge cities where people are coming together um, and, and the surpluses of food we have, they're increasing our population now, but will they be increasing our population in the long run? Or through damaging the environment, will we actually be diminishing ourselves on our own process? Um, so again, don't think of it, you know, we need to kill, we need to kill people to save the environment. Um, that's not really what they mean, although that's often a kind of criticism of, of this sort of stuff. Um, so just questions to think about again. So from this, again, the big question as a sociologist, imagine we're operating right now in the social develop, in the, sorry, in the dominant social paradigm. Most people, you know, we like to think we're, we care about the environment, but we usually prioritize humans. And I'm not singling anyone out. I'm not, you know, I, I welcomely admit that only recently have I started to become more interested in the environment. And part of that is that I think as a society, we've all been becoming more woke or whatever to environmental issues. Um, but I can admit that as a sociologist, I've been, you know, more focused on, on humans. Um, and I, I've increasingly, uh, that's been on my radar. And so imagining that most people are like that, we have our limitations, we're not always thinking about everything all the time. Um, what might, what are the, what are the big differences between an approach to society where you really look at, you know, maybe not deep ecology yet, because again, we have to go through things in phases. Um, if you take a functionalist approach, things don't just happen overnight. Um, but what might it look like uh, to actually start building things with an eye to sustainable development? Um, things like the university, there's now a bunch of initiatives to make it more sustainable. But are things like classroom part of a sustain uh, sustain uh, sustainable, sustainably development model? Um, are, they, are they part of that? Um, would online learning be better for that? Um, just, just sorts of things to ask. Again, decentering humans, recentering the environment. Um, okay, so you're not done. And I will have an end of the lecture. Now all our, our funds, our funds will begin. Oh, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to pace it out. I have so many things. Um, oops, channel, private channel, socio three, socio three. I don't know what to start with. Um, okay, wait. The what? The Kahoot? Oh, they already did that. Okay. Um, so, who wants the Kahoot? Okay. So, we'll, okay. So, we'll do Kahoot and games. Um, any of you that wants to take a little break, I have to set the stuff up only for like two minutes. So, if you want a break, you can go right now. Uh, but I think we just had one, so it's probably fine. Um, so, we'll do the Kahoot game. So, you can log in, but don't leave. I won't let you leave until it's done. And you can't, with Kahoot anyway, you know, you, you wanted it, but Kahoot kind of locks you in because you have to look from there. Um, okay, so are you ready? You'll see my Kahoot skills. My first Kahoot. Oh, right? Oh. oh, wait, I don't know the options. I'm making the options. Okay. Okay, wait. Who wants... Then do you, do you like the name generator or do you want to make your own lit names? Oh, own lit names? Show of hands if you want to make your own names. Oh, I knew it. Are you going to be lit one, lit two, lit three, lit four? Yeah. I want to see your sociological imagination. Okay, random order of questions, yes. Random order of answers, yes. Right, that seems good. Okay, one day we'll do team, but we're not there yet. Okay, so, okay. Whoa. Do do do, Kahoot! I didn't know it had music because I made it on mute, but I found that out yesterday. Uh oh, be ready. Don't worry, I give you twenty seconds. Dun, dun, dun. So, who wants to explain why pansexuality is right? Yep. Well, the 
Like gender, like, or, 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 yes. Okay. <laughs> Number one. Do do do. Ready? Lit one. Lit one. Oh. Okay. This theory uses insights offered by Darwin to explain how societies change over time. Bro, fast. Boom, 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 boom. Boom, boom, boom. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah, Zara. Boom, boom, boom. No, it's evolutionary theory. Evolutionary theory. Evolutionary theory. Oh. Bear paw. Evolution. Bear paw. Oh, so, oops. Okay. Okay, so that's evolutionary theory. I think that one's pretty explanatory. So evolutionary theory kind of comes out of functionalism, um, and it's that societies evolve over time. So social Darwinists often use this. Okay. Scoreboard, lit one. Oh, lit one is really doing well, lit one. In today's global HIV AIDS pandemic, which social category is emerging as the most vulnerable? Who's most vulnerable to HIV? Oh, Stop dodging them. Pick them up. Oh, whoa. Whoa. I knew that one would trick some of you. Yeah, so for young men, it's probably HIV AIDS is very prevalent in, in gay communities, but the biggest, the biggest um, so globally, um, the biggest uh, victims or sufferers of HIV AIDS are usually young women, uh, many of whom are kind of forced into the sex trade. Um, so that one's trickier, but you sociologists got it mostly right. Okay. Let one. Oh, Ali, coming up. Bubble, lit 100. Oh, lit 100. OK. Boom. Question four. Which approach views work as an integral part of the social structure? You should all get this. Which one sees work as very important? Oh. Conflict? No, they see, they, they see work as like bad for society. Integral. So integral part of, so social structure should kind of be tipping you off with this. Um, work is part of our necessary society. So again, 75% of you are lit. 25% of you need to not, you need to be lit in that. Oh, lit one, oh, lit one, lit one. No, lit one. Um, Babs now, bubble, getting tough. Symbolic interactionists argue that crime is... Go! Oh. Oh. Yay! 90% of you got that right! It's learned through social interactions. Babs, Ali, Bubble, Durkheim coming up, Lawrence William. Not to be confused with Lawrence Williams. Okay. Question six, Blank argues that sexuality is fashioned and refashioned through discourses. Blah, discourse. Blah. I'm not very good at throwing. Wait, you play baseball, you're better at throwing. She plays baseball. Anywhere where the wind takes you. Oh. Okay, not like that. Don't throw it like baseball. See, that's why. Okay. So the key here, post-structuralism. Remember, when you think of discourses, I had some students today, it's usually post-structural. So that's the closest. 
This is a little bit challenging because you're probably expecting like Foucault or something. Um, feminist post-structuralism is the closest. So in questions like this, again, think, use your sociology hat, and think um, which is the most likely. Because you may not have heard of that if you didn't read that part, or you know, it's not always what I talk about, but it's the closest here. Allie's getting it. Bubble, Durkheim, Scotian. The lits are gone. Lits are out of the running. No, lits, you better, come on. Lits. Lawrence wore a t oh, some of them. Lawrence wore a t-shirt one class with the following words on it. I'm a little teapot. Too cool for you. Well, I am. Lit, lit AF, which one am I? Who's been paying attention? Who's been paying attention? Oh! Oh! Bubble. Okay, so I'm doing special. Um, who's Bubble? Bubble! Okay. Bubble, come to the front of the room. You get special surprise number one. Bubble. Bubble. You got a ticket. You can exchange that ticket for something. One thing only. No. Thins Oreo. So you get to keep the ticket. That's not done yet. Special, right? You never know. Okay. Give it up for Bubble. Bubble. Okay. Now you're intrigued with the tickets, right? Okay, next. Question eight. Blank refers to behaviors that occur when people come together to achieve a short-term goal. Talked about this recently. AO3 fail. Collective behavior short term. Remember, social movements long term. Short term collective behaviors. You're right. Social movement, if you didn't take Socio AO3, that would be right. But in Socio AO3, we learn that collective behaviors are towards short term. Bubble. Bubble's still doing it. Scotian, Ali, Hannah. Okay. Next. Question nine. Which is not a stage of the life cycle of social change? Look at that. <laughs> when you make a change, first you innovate. I have an idea. I want everyone to take Socio 3. Then it exponentially grows. I develop a YouTube channel and I become an influencer and everyone becomes lit and it grows. And then it saturates. Everyone does it and everyone takes Socio 3 around the world via my YouTube channel. Consensus is not right. Um, so it is not a stage of the social cycle. I just added that in. Remember, there's a slide on that. So this, this is a good study tip. It means you have to, on the slide, a lot of the things I'm testing are going to be from slides. But it's good. 20 of you still got that. Oh, uh, sorry, 28. Because it was right and it was not right. So, uh, it, which is not, so it's consensus. Bubble. We're narrowing in. Lit one, lit 100. Got to pull up. Lawrence William needs to come up. Okay. I don't have favorites. I don't know who you are. But which of the, fo which of the following is a, contempor is a contemporary economic sector? Oh, good. Tertiary. Can anyone explain what the tertiary sector is? You already answered. Who? Yep. Yes. 
to, can I make this lit? Oh. Sort of, okay. Scoreboard, T. Oh, there's someone new. Who's, wow, you came up out of nowhere. Who's T? T, come on down. T, give it up for T. Whoa. You get the golden ticket, and then you get the world's your oyster. I was right with the cookies. Give it up for tea. Okay. Oh, there's other things I can do with that. I never saw that. Up eight places. Okay, good. So, um, well, I have to do it now that I said it. Who was up eight places? Who's the highest climber right now? Who is that? Who is that name right there? Okay. Come on up. I'm randomly doing the ticket thing. So. World. There's Play Doh. There's microwave popcorn, Pop Tarts, maple syrup. Oh. Give it up. Okay. Now you gotta rush. Okay. A hypothesis is usually used in which kind of study? Do do do. Oh, there isn't. No, no exam, no nothing. Oh, there's no class. Oh, how do you know? Oh, okay. <laughs> Quantitative. Not qualitative. It's the opposite. A hypothesis is what you expect to find. Qualitative is more inductive. A hypothesis is deductive. We're trying to deduce. Oh. Bubbles back. Minion. Minion is new. Okay, I'll keep my eye on Minion. Okay, question 12. Tuition fees and tuition fee increases in Canada are highest in these disciplines. Ooh, is it sociology? Which have the highest fee increases? Use your sociological imagination. Why would the fees go up? Ha. It's professional programs. Because there's more money involved. It's people willing to pay. Natural sciences still have that air of science, like social science. So it's not, not seen quite as, remember the relationship between the education and the market. Professional programs have the tightest relationship, therefore they can justify having the highest prices. They're most likely to get you a job. Minion, oh, I kept my eye on you. Minion, Minion. Come up, Minion. Oh. And Lawrence is lit. Come on up, Lawrence is lit. Oh, right in the, yeah. Lawrence is lit. Take a ticket, take a prize. Yeah, there's books. Oh, the first book taker. Oh, book. Yay, give it up for Lawrence is lit and Minion. Okay. Question 13. Researchers who use inductive logic move from that to that. Yep. Sarah? Oh, you got it right. Oh, here's your ticket. What, is it? what kind of cookies do you like? Oreo? Oh. Chunks Ahoy? A chocolate chip? Oh. Yes, I do. Ooh. Chewy chocolate chip. Keep it. Just keep it for now. Oh! Yes. Remember, this one could be tricky. They move from data to theory. 
They don't move from theory to data. Remember, inductive logic is I don't know what I'm looking for yet, but I'm doing an exploratory study. And then from that, I derive the broader theory. Um, so very often, that would go from qualitative to quantitative also. Um, but the most correct answer there is data to theory, then qualitative to quantitative. Um, theory to data and quantitative to qualitative are not right. Um, so it's good. See this? Again, think deductive. Um, theory to data is the deductive approach. I have a theory. I think that if I wear this hat, then um, students will be lit. Uh, that's, that would be deductive. Um, so if I wear this hat, my students will be lit because I'll be like charging them up. Um, inductive would be, you know, I don't know what will happen if I wear this hat, but I'm going to do it anyway, and then I'm going to find out if it makes the students more lit. Um, so data to theory. Okay. Minion. Oh. Lawrence is lit. Still there. Okay. Question 14. Where in Canada are immigrants most likely to settle? We got maple syrup. You might all get this, maybe. Yeah, good. Populous means a lot of people. So it kind of gives the answer away. But it's also um, that they move to cities more than to rural places, right? Remember what we were just talking about in the new environmentalism and new ecological. Uh, people are less likely to go to places with less development. Oh, same. Oh, that's almost the same. You guys are, because you got that right, I guess, so it stays the same. 15, credentialism. In modern society, acts to maintain. Oh, divisive. Social inequality. Credentialism, you could say that it maintains post-secondary enrollment, but here's the thing. Credentialism maintains that, in a way. It maintains workforce participation, and it maintains our technological standards. So if you see that multiple answers seem correct, you have to think, okay, what's the bigger thing that it's maintaining? So social inequality was the main theme we were discussing in higher education. So this one, again, most questions I won't word this way, but some are more complex. Um, so for this one, it is, again, if, if you think multiple answers seem correct, I'm usually getting at something else. Um, so again, ultimately, credentialism, it's the idea that certain people have access to jobs and others don't uh, by virtue of their credentials. So it's not really uh, a latent consequence of this is post-secondary enrollment. They're not making it to make people stay in education. Um, the, the impact, uh, according to the textbook, or the reason for credentialism, again, um, is to keep jobs prestigious. So ultimately, of these, it's more social inequality. Um, again, so trying to give you a range of questions because I know I made them too easy in the in the previous one. Oh, minion, alley, competitors, up nine places, Marimo. Yep, alley and Marimo. Alley gets a ticket. Marimo gets a ticket. Fucking Plato, Plato. Give it up, Ali Marimo. Okay, so now, special. Oh, when I go viral, oh my god, this might be worth more than like $3. So, right? Okay. Question 16 Symbolic interactionists would argue that culture. <gasps> Yay! It's actively created by individuals in an ongoing manner. So there's lots of things there that give that away, right? Remember, symbolic interaction is all about active activity. They don't really talk about things being functional. They don't really talk about objective observable. Um, and they don't really talk about power. So I get why you may have thought definitions, and I get the objectively observable, because I say they're not really that theoretical. Um, but again, this is more about active creation. So um, that's usually the way they view things. 
scoreboard, aluminium bubble, Scotian and Hannah. Do do do. How many? Ooh, special, special, special. Um, how many chapters does the final exam cover? Do 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 do. do, do. Oh, yes, it covers 20. Oh, I'm glad no one said 30, because that would have been, you know, yeah. We don't have 25 chapters, so review more closely if you said 25. 15, I understand, but it's 20. So it's all 20. But um, it's more emphasized, I decided, things more towards the middle and end of the course, with the exception of this week. Um, major themes, as I'll discuss, from the first half of the, of, of the year, um, but predominantly things around the midterm and after. Uh, major, major themes, though. Uh, nothing will be, because, every, because the benefit of it covering everything um, is most of the questions will be things that you can see from lecture slides um, and things I've talked about. So I'm not, gonna, I'm not going after tiny little details. Um, but yes, it, it does cover everything. And again, you'll have your tutorials this week and my real study guide, because this is the, the interactive study guide, but I have another one. And we're recording this, so uh, you can study this at home too. Scoreboard, Bubble Ali Minion, Scotch and Hannah. Oh, so this means Bubble gets it again, because they're top of the list at the time of the special question. That's how it works. Matthew effect, Bubble. I'll change the rule for the next one, because I'm allowed to do that. Bubble is dom dominating the leaderboard. Oh, first one. Bubble got it right away. Give it up for Bubble. But you know what, because it's special. Christina, the highest leader. Who's Christina? Come, Christina. Yay. Yeah, I'm thinking, because I, I still have to save some of the prizes for the other thing at the end. Good. Keep your ticket. Make your choice. Yay. OK, so that's a count, sort of. OK. Oh, one we asked today. The dominant social paradigm is based on Take and pass around. Thank you. No problem. Take and pass around. Okay. Cookies, because I can't throw the cookies. Okay. Oh, oh, oh. Oh. So it's good to see this, because I made this too tricky. So the idea for this, again, is the dominant social paradigm. Remember, I kept saying economic relations. So those of you who got it right should be really proud. Um, it's based on economic relations. Anthropocentrism, I understand. So this, this is learning. So those, that you, those of you that came to my office hours today, when things like this happen, and I understand why you have it the other way, um, I, that's when I make both options available. So this is partly my fault. I was emphasizing anthropocentrism. But again, the dominant social paradigm is really, remember, the big thing that I was criticizing or showing that the textbook was criticizing was that we've been privileging economic relations and technology over the environment. So technically, it's capitalism that this is targeting more um, than the tendency to put ourselves first. Um, on a test situation, though, if I saw this, I would make both answers correct for this one, because I understand both. Um, but. Bubble and Alley and see, so the, the consistent pack leaders still got it right. So that's it's a learning opportunity, right? So it's either they're better at reading my mind, or um, I think you know it's it's possible because the same people are also at the top. So it's a good learning moment too, right? So um, again, I was talking about anthropocentrism, but the key thing was more that it was economic. 
So that's, again, at a level of questions, that's a challenging one, but one that I think you can still get. Um, so again, it's not always the most obvious one. It's the key assumption. So I'm glad that some of you got that right. Question 19. A social landscape in which new communication technology promotes interaction is referred to. Yay, most of you got it right. Digital sociality. T is back on the board. Boom. Question 20. Which of the following is not the principle of healthcare in Canada? Yay! Organized. I just made that up. Okay. So again, the, the three principles, comprehensive, accessible, universal. And that should be on a slide. I believe it. Yeah. Oh, nice. Which of the following best describes the nature versus nurture debate? Different explanations of human behavior. Good. Yay. Yay. T's moving up. The contemporary Canadian approach to intergroup minority relations is. So, what's our thing? What term is that? What term do we always use? Yes, we use the Canadian approach on the surface is multiculturalism. It may seem more like assimilation when you critique it, but that's the official policy. So don't overthink it. The 12 of you that put assimilation may have overthought that. So it's the contemporary Canadian approach. The government does not say we're living in assimilation. We're seen as multicultural. That may, there may be more assimilation going on, but um, the, the official term is that. Yep. The type of orientation that appreciates, that appreciates the intrinsic worth of all cultures is called? So sees all cultures as valuable. Cultural relativism. Cultural pluralism means that you accept having multiple cultures. Cultural relativism is that all cultures are un... Uh, you, you can't compare them because they all have their own value. So it's a more moral thing. Cultural relativism is literally cultures are relative. You can't compare them. So a little bit of a challenging question, but many of you still got that right. Okay. 24. Durkheim is discussion of religion. Separated the world into... Yay! Okay, that makes, yeah. So the profane and the sacred, those are his terms. The sacred was everything religious and permanent, profane was everything else. Um, he didn't use the word secular about this. Um, or, so it was, he didn't, and, and this is in his discussion of religion. So also, he's discussing religion, so he doesn't call the religious things religious, he calls them sacred. Um, so this was more specific on his writing. Um, so good, I'm glad the bulk of you still got that.
Okay. As reported by the ILO, this percentage of workers lives in poverty around the world today. Remember, we used this, we talked about this statistic. This is from one of our lectures. Do, 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 do. 50%, yeah. It's more than you'd think. 35, you think, oh, that's in the middle, it's probably that. No, 50. Lawrence Jr. is the highest climber. Lawrence Jr. Lawrence Jr. Well, Lawrence Jr. has to get something, because that's Lawrence Jr. But I have, it's the, you'll get a ticket, but I'm running low on those prizes. You're getting a ticket and a handful. Still lit, still lit, because I, I'm miscalculating because I have my special prizes coming up. Okay. I was too generous to the early ones, so you were lucky. You're lucky that the structure wasn't there yet, so the agency, the, the cookie agency was there. Okay. 26. The calculation oh, of a triple bottom line includes, oh, remember I talked about that. Which one wasn't in the triple bottom line? Which one? What was the triple bottom line? That turtle has a shell, but it's looking at a shell. Which one's not in the triple bottom line? We did that today. Yay, progress. The planet was number three. It was profit people planet. Remember, triple bottom line is what businesses have to include when they're businessing. We have the same consistent five. Oh, bubble in the hat. Well, she's charmed now with the hat. Since 1991, crime rates have been... Yay, decreasing. Yay, less crime. So not increasing, so that's good. You were supposed to, not you, people that didn't take Socio 3, you're supposed to think it's increasing. And the book says, not that you didn't take Socio 3 if you got it wrong. That's the intuitive thing. But actually, crime rates have been going down. But crime panics and things have been going up. Um, so crime rates have, have been going down. So that's one nice thing. Still remaining. OK, angles. So angles writes with marks. So angles argued that bank conditions determine family life. This is the harder one. I just want to throw some harder ones in there. Don't get too specific, right? Yay, material, yes, good. Monetary was the, the MacGuffin question, the one that, um, you know, the, the one that seems right but, but is wrong. Material, remember, you know, uh, we're all living in a material world. Madonna, right? So um, material, Marx and Engels, materialism, historical materialism, that's the big thing. So material conditions determine family life. Monetary is just part of that, but it's more that we're living in this bigger technological structure. So again, don't lose the forest for the trees. I'm not trying to be tricky. I'm trying to get the main thing, material. Do do do. The writings of Karl Marx draw our attention to. Oh, look, it's Marx, the statue. What's the biggest thing? The biggest thing. So these are a bit harder. Uh, what's the biggest? What did he influence the most? Yay! Okay, wow. Okay, good. The other MacGuffin there was authority, because many of you could think that. Good, no one thought meaning and subjectivity. Very good, because he's not that at all. Um, but he does talk about authority, but the biggest thing is power. So remember, co he's conflict theory, which then gives rise um, to the contemporary theory. So great, I'm very, very happy. Okay. Boom. 30 to the. Which perspective suggests that religion serves an important purpose? You all should get this right. Don't overthink it. Which one says religion's important? Don't overthink it. Fine.
functionalism. What, what, okay, I want to know why did half of you think symbolic interactionism? Because now it's making me. Why? Who, so who, okay, yeah. Mm hmm Okay, so that's great. So the, the one reason why it's fun, so this is one of the ones where you have to um, think which is the best. So symbolic interactionists, they would say that religion serves, may serve an important function. This is too general. It's saying religion serves an important function. Symbolic interactionists start without theory. They wouldn't know that. This is a statement ahead of time, right? It's saying religion serves an important function. So functionalists are the only ones that would really say that ahead of time. Right? So I get it, that, but that's overthinking it. Functionalism, because then you have to say, but isn't functionalism saying that? Function, that was Durkheim and talking about the key religion. Right? So think suicide rates, places that didn't have enough religion or were too fatalist in the religion. Symbolic interactionism would say, religion may serve an important person for people, but atheists it doesn't, people that aren't religious it doesn't. Um, so they don't ask questions like that. They don't talk about important purposes. That's something functionalists talk about, right? So you have to look for key words like that. They don't ask those sorts of questions. Um, for them, it's more, what function? It's much more open-ended. It's more inductive. Um, so good, I'm glad most of you got that right, but that is a bit more challenging. Question 31. Another term for sociobiology is, this was discussed earlier in the year. Oh, evolutionary sociology was only invented a few years ago. Evolutionary psych this is from this is directly from the textbook. Um, so evolutionary psychology, um, and this that is another word for sociobiology. Sociobiology was termed. Remember, I talked about E. O. Wilson. He created. He had a book called The Grand Synthesis: Evolutionary Sociology. Um, evolution. Sorry, the grand th uh, the grand thesis: sociobiology. Evolutionary psychology is what that's called now. So that's Googleable. Um, again, this is more, this is just a wide variety of questions. Not many are like this. This is very specific. But again, just want to show you these things. And our top five is still there, so. As an economic system, capitalism is best defined with reference to. Yay, private ownership. That's the central thing. Woohoo. Which theory posits that people should remain engaged in society for as long as possible? Look at that. She's engaged. Hula. Hula. Really? I made that up. I made that up. It might exist, but not in this class. I made that up. Activity theory. You're active. Disengagement, you disengage. Remember I talked about those. I'm glad. Okay, that's good. No one said differential association. That's crime. Engagement, I just made that up. Question 34. Contemporary sociologists prefer to use this term instead of the term third world. I talked a lot about this. Oh, good. Yay. If I, if I put South Park, would you have put that? Well, I would imagine. 
Um, OK, good. Global South. Yes. Not South World. No one put Fourth World. That's good. The essence of a socialist economic system is, remember, it's very different from capitalism, hint, hint. So you should all get this right because it came after the capitalist one. Yay, yes. Collective ownership of the means of production. No, I'm not judging them by saying they have groupthink. Um, that all the, <laughs> so it's collective ownership of the means of production. Good. OK. Question 36. Families, according to functionalists, do all of the following except. Look at that. That's a family. Remember, functionalists, not sociologists, not conflict theorists, functionalists. Yay. Exactly, right? Now, I understand discipline, because you think, oh, functionalists think everything works. They would see discipline as a, part of, a normal part of childbirth. The first stage of any social change is, we talked about this already, right? So you should all get this right. We talked about this just today. We're getting near the end. Innovation. Don't ever think it. Remember the, the, the it was innovation and then and then it was it was innovation ending with saturation. Collective unrest is something people experience, but that's not technically part of the life cycle. It's innovating the idea. That's coming before the social change. The first stage. Once you've done it, you have to innovate. You have to make something new. So good. Seven left, eight left. The view of human beings as separate from and above the rest of nature. Ah. Yay! Anthropocentrism. Don't overthink it with human exceptionalism. It's similar, but it's not exactly the same thing. It's more exempting yourself from history and, and from damage. Anthropocentrism is putting you literally at the center. That's the definition. Pretty much. That's, more, that's similar, mostly the definition. 39. A theoretical statement attempts to explain how certain facts or events are. So what's it trying to do? That we did this early, early, early in the year. Yeah, I think this was from the test. Yeah. Oh, got to review those early chapters. Related. This is directly from one, I think, test one I had this. Um, so it, it's theories, again, are saying, oh, I have this going on. Oh, there's that going on. How do I connect them? How do I connect these different outcomes? How do I connect these different phenomena? Understood. Um, that's a bigger process, but the thing that it's trying to do, how are these events related? That's, that's the number, that's a theoretical statement. So it's not about understood is too broad. So it would be, you know, what's, what's the theory of socialization? Um, it's that, you know, the external environment can provide people with ideas, uh, with senses of selves. Uh, what's a theory of deviance? So differential association. It's that your behavior and yourself are connected through differential association. So it's how things are related. Theories are bringing things together. Which of the following is not a social determinant of health? So what's not a social cause of health? This one you have to use a special kind of sense for. One of these isn't social. Age isn't social. You can have social ideas of age, but age is not social. It's a determinant of health, biologically, yes, but 
Minority status, that's a social construction. Income is social. Gender is a social construction in this class. Age is not social. So it can't be a social determinant of health. It can be a determinant. You could say, oh, if I'm experiencing ageism and stuff. But age itself is not social. Unless I'm, we're all, you know, we make up our own ages. Okay. At least according to Western medicine, age isn't, age isn't social. All right. So the transmission of messages through a device to a large audience is referred to as... Mass media isn't the transmission, it's the thing. Mass media is the whole media. Mass communication is delivering point A to point B. Yes. The transmission, that's the act. Mass media is not an act, it's a thing. Mass communication is, again, what the words mean. You're communicating to a mass audience. Do -do -do. The experience of culture shock typically goes away once a person Good, yes, acclimatizes to the new culture. Some people might tune out the new culture, but what would that be? Like, screw you, I'm just gonna do my own thing. No, most of the time you have a culture shock. Whoa, I'm in university for the first time, but then I get used to it through things like study buddy activities, right? I'm helping you uh, get rid of your culture shock. Okay, bubble on fire, look at that. Oh my gosh, one, look at that. Holy, right? Look at, what are the statistical odds of that, right? That's intense, intense competition. Look at that, T, one. Can you imagine the, the, the fame that you'll lose by being number two, whoever's number two? Bubble, you have the hat, but the prestige of one, look at that, okay. Industrialization and immigration, no, no stakes, right? Industrialization and immigration paved the way for, oh. Look at this. Epic battle. Epic battle. This is intense stuff, man. Oh! Everyone got it right? Except for three. That's okay. Big lead now. Come on, it's not over. It's not over. Two left. Oh, Mead's term for the group of attributes that we associate with the average member of society is, again, we're going back. Look at that little bird and that grasshopper. Yay! So, the average member of society. So remember the generalized level. Remember I talked about the pressure I had feeling to go back to school because I said, oh, there's just people that, you know, it wasn't one specific person. That's a me. A me could be my mom, a friend, someone I internalize, a voice of someone. Um, the I is that me thinking through things. Um, it's that active sense of agency. The generalized other is what I think society thinks. Um, so it's, you know, if I drop out of school, I think maybe, maybe people, quote unquote, will think I'm not smart. Um, that's the general idea. Um, so we associate it with the average member. What will people think, kind of thing. Last one. Oh, and this is special. What is Lawrence's favorite word? Oh, 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 oh. Subjective question. Subjective special question. Hell didn't put lit. Oh, okay, you know. Like, <laughs> ah. Okay. So. Okay. Uh oh. I've lost connect. Oh. Oh. 
podium, bubble tea, and Scotian. Bubble tea, look at that. <laughs> Who likes bubble tea? People from Nova Scotia, right? So, Scotian. Um, okay, so what we're going to do, um, so everyone with a ticket, we'll get to that soon, and then the other extended. So, um, or no, this, this has priority. So, come on up, bubble tea and Scotian. Come on up. Oh, Scotian, the identified. Scotian. Okay, so you get to pick a prize. Oh, I guess I guess in order. Bubble. Yeah. Scotian one of the eggies. Yeah. Yes. Tough choices, T. Oh, the microwave popcorn. Okay. I I don't know why it called. I can't. I don't know how to change my name. Um, it's not showing me the damn report. Oh, give us a moment to crunch the numbers. Oh, I don't. Okay. Scary Larry won. Question number two. Oh, I didn't know it gives these reports. Okay. Look at that. 26 was the trickiest and 25 was the easiest. That's funny. I think you guys just gave up on 26. You, you were burned out and then the fact that that's the hardest one. 36 players didn't answer some of the questions. No, you've got to answer all of the questions. Okay. Oh, that's good. It has analytics. Oh, I like this. See? So I'm learning from this. So I know I'll actually read this report and I can augment the test based on what's... That's what I'm okay. Um, that's cool. I didn't know it did that. So you, I should have listened to you before. People were telling me to use Kahoot. That's pretty lit. It's pretty lit. Oh, progress. Look at that. My gosh. Okay. All right. Um, so there's two more people there. So Allie and Hanvan, come on, up, come on up and get a prize. Whoever gets there first can pick first. Oh. Tough choices. Yay, sweet hot Skittles. Who knows what those will taste like? No, people like sweet chili heat Doritos. Oreos, can't go wrong. Okay, now, everybody with a ticket, come up. Boom, 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 grab a prize. I think just one because we're running out. Or if you want a second one, you can take an arrow bar because it's smaller. Or one from here. Yeah. Just because I, I didn't bring enough lit stuff. Okay. You can keep the ticket as a lifelong souvenir. Oh, that's nice of you. See how generous these people are? So we still have more stuff, which I'll, so I can use for the rest. Um, so, oops. Okay, so what's the best way to do this? Um, yeah, see, so they're all, they're all, not poison. I wouldn't do that. It's my social AO3 children. Um, students, adults, autonomy. Um, okay, so. Not done. What time is it? Oh, good. I still have, I, I still have a little bit of time. Okay.
Okay. So wait. Um, first, I guess just I'm not like. Did you did you have fun with the Kahoot game? Is it good? So that was like study prep. I'm hoping you'll see. So um, the test, obviously, not all of the questions are going to be the same or anything, but it's, that's how I'm thinking about the questions. It's also good to see which ones were harder because I'm going to augment. You know, some were easier than I thought, some were harder. So it's good information for me to have. So it's good. I'll do it in the future. I like I like your um, advice about that. Um, ask for food. Got none. There's still food. So that's why I have this. Um, so if anyone wants cookies, come up and grab some while we're continuing. Just come up. It's fine. Um, yeah, whoever wants stuff, come up. So what I'm going to do, um, so I have special things, you know, you know, because I always get worried. I'm like, oh, what if my what if my videos go viral and then the silly things I do um, become whatever? But that's not going to happen. And B, I've already done enough silly things. So anyway, it's April Fool's Day, so I was going to do something, but I don't know because you guys are too nice. So I don't want to I don't want to scare anyone. So. No, I'm going to show it, but it's not, yeah, okay, so, uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. Does anyone here know Ariana Grande? Oh my God, right? Oh my God, what? Like, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? What's going to happen? So you know what I did? Because I'm a troll. So I went online, and I wanted to look up, like, trending songs that, like, Gen Z's like. And I was like, who's this Ariana Grande? Like, I like Grande coffee at Starbucks. Anyway. So Seven Rings. Do any of you know that song? Is it, is it lit or is it not lit? I don't know what people think. Is it, is it lit? Okay. Is it lit? Is this going to be, so this could be what destroys my future. No, it won't. Um, anyway. What's going to happen, right? No swearing in Social 03. Right?
Uh oh, uh oh, deep, deep. Oh. Oh. I'll miss you too. I miss. Always lit. Okay, so real deal. So I'll make this not. That one's not going public. You guys only get that. So, um, but you got my final exam video. Okay, wait. I'll ask that as a Mentimeter question, but because uh, I, I don't want. I don't. I don't want. Oops. Oh, I closed my Mentimeter. That's okay. Okay. Um, so, if you go, sorry, so where is it? Do, 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 do. Oh, it timed out. Okay. So, course evaluations, I, oh, more of you did it during this. So, um, on a serious note, again, I've tried, I've had a lot of fun teaching this class. Obviously, hopefully that, that's come across. If anything's come across, um, my narcissism with my holiday lottery and these little things. Um, but I'm trying to make it fun and keep it serious at the same time. Um, I've really enjoyed doing this. Um, so I want your, you to do evaluations. Again, no matter what you say, it's not about the score. I just like you to do them because uh, I think it's uh, just something good to do. Um, any feedback is welcome. Um, so. Uh, if you could turn off the web option just for a little bit, so. So I hope you remember, you know, take homes. You each lecture this week. That's really good to take home. These are quite helpful. Like, these are quite useful. So it's easy to get them on the internet. Try to test yourself. What I would really do is look at, listen to the summary of each chapter in the video. Attempt to answer the essay question. As you're doing so, then go to my lecture notes and the lectures. Your lecture notes. And then anything that's unclear, go to the specific part of the text where concepts um, that we'll discuss were kind of unclear. Um, and keep doing that until less and less concepts are unclear. Um, now, I'm going to in this video, I'm not trying to, to narrow down in, in the idea of the level of the concepts that we'll, we'll be discussing. Um, so, in terms of studying that, I'm really going to give you this um, kind of as a pretty first study guide. Um, of course, there will be things that I have mentioned that are kind of testable. Um, you are responsible for reading the whole text. Um, and I, I hope you're intrinsically motivated to do so. I do know it's a long, long class of being a full year over 20 chapters, um, so I got to narrow that chapter. Um, but you know, I would say start with the video, try to do the essay questions, um, and then go through the lecture slides, um, and, uh, and then go through the text for anything that's over there. Um, so please stay in touch with me. If I don't see you again, it's so um, we'll see you in the front of the exam. Say hi to them. But I'm going forward to me. I'm shooting an email. Uh, I don't know where I'll be. Uh, I remember right now I'm teaching at UTSC. Um, but you never know where I'll be. Um, I hope you all major in sociology. And even if you don't, um, I hope you do. Everything goes amazing. See you at the next meeting. It's a fantastic class. Yay. So undergrad research day is, I think I opened the link, um, undergrad research day is Tuesday, April 9th, pretty much all day, 10 a.m. to 2.45, MW 1.30. So please go to last week's lecture. I'll make an announcement again, and you can register there. So Tuesday, April 9th, 10 to 2.45. Um, the three students who are participating from this class are going to be there. Um, but you're all welcome to. You can see upper year students. I'll be there. A bunch of other profs will be there. Um, yeah, Andrew, so the peer mentor for the Tuesday class, he's, uh, he's presenting there. Uh, Ujwal should be there. Sarah, will you be there? Good time? Maybe. She might be there. Um, so a lot of people will be there. Um, so, so just going forward, um, so, oh, and I'll show the thing. So final exam info, again, I have it here. It's worth 25% of your grade. Now, 60 multiple, you may have seen some different numbers. I finalized it. 60 multiple choice, not the questions, but the structure. 60 multiple choice questions, 10 short answer questions, one bonus question. 
Everything's the expectations the same as the other tests. This seems longer, but you have a whole other hour, so it's actually proportionally a bit shorter. Um, also, it's worth a lot more. Um, so you'll see that the 60 multiple choice are worth one mark each instead of 1.5, so that's the only thing that's different. Um, but it's still roughly the same. It's like two thirds multiple choice, um, well, a little bit more this way 60% multiple choice, 40% of short answer. Um, and then an actual bonus question. So it's not worth, it's worth one, and then it's, you can, so you can potentially get 101. Um, the final exam is cumulative, but please pay attention to my study guide. I'm not going to try to trick you or anything. Um, so, you know, obviously I can't cover everything, as you'll see in the, in the video. I try to frame up the importance of everything, um, but I, I, I am um, making this exam in a way where, you know, I think, can you say some of the most, or, or understand some of the most important things of how a sociologist would understand every chapter? So, how do we understand methods? What, like, what's important about classical theory? What's important about the study of culture? Whatever the topic is. Um, so, not little tiny things. Although, obviously, you know, I've been invested in sociology for 10 years. So, what I consider a little tiny thing, um, or sorry, what I consider major may seem minor to you. Um, so, you know, I, part of today, again, seeing how you've scored and what was difficult, I am trying to make things fair. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's U of T and it's challenging. Um, so, uh, you know, not everything will be self evident. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a test. Um, so, again, watch the study guide. Um, look out for the SOS study guide. That might be more useful. Again, that's made by students. Again, so you'll have both of our perspectives. Um, that'll be posted uh, by Wednesday night. Go to tutorials. Uh, Rewatch this. So that's why I had the Kahoot part recorded. Um, so you can look at that. Again, the questions won't be identical, but similar. Um, and yeah, focus on major themes, but at the same time, know some of the key specifics, like today. So use today as a learning moment, especially the ones that people were divided on. I was happy that you know there was no question that everyone got wrong. Um, so you know some of you, and in particular, there were trends. So um, watch those again and see you know oh there's certain kind of patterns. Um, and and again, many students have scored kind of consistently on both tests and the essays. So um, again, I'm trying to be fair, but I know that things are different. Um, so it's the this is the end of me. You have though you know I have office hours again tomorrow for the Tuesday section, but you can come to that. I have a three hour review on Friday. You can stop by whenever you want. And then I'll have a couple more sessions of office hours at least before the final exam. Um, so you'll see me on the interweb if you don't see me in the office. Um, this week, the tutorials are, um, you know, you go to them, they're test reviews. So again, seeing another perspective, um, we still have uh, one more session. So with Sarah, when is that? Uh, that is on Wednesday from 2 to 5. Yeah. Wednesday, 2 to 5? in HL 459, so lots of opportunities available. Make use of them. I posted those research opportunities too on Quercus. Apply for those. They're actively looking for any, but for, for first year, second year, third year, fourth year. So I know someone asked me, are they looking for fourth year? No, they're looking for people that are interested and have skill sets that they think can be used. No. Nope. OK, and so yeah, th I guess that's annual general meeting. Yeah, the Okay, well, so imagine the Social AO3 team. Come up, Sarah. Come up here. She'll stand in for the whole team. So from Social AO3, you know, again, the one thing I tried to do in this class, and for those of you online too, um, you know, as someone, I'm very open about the fact that I dropped out of school when I was younger, um, and I went to St. George campus, and I found it, you know, a little bit alienating. Um, not dissing St. George, but that was just my experience. I didn't use a lot of things that were available to me, and, you know, I had baggage and stuff. Um, I've tried to make this class warm and open. I know it's big, and I know the web option. That's why I had the question. Many people didn't come physically. Um, but I'd like to think that you remember this as kind of, you know, you're obviously in other classes. Um, but, but, you know, hopefully this made university, the transition here, a little bit easier um, in whatever capacity we could, while at the same time still being a difficult course. Um, you know, I'm not, I think it's relative, the other courses. I tried to stay in the same range, but, you know, not perfect. Um, but so, you know, if you major in sociology or you're anywhere, you see me around. I know sometimes people see me and then they're afraid to say something. If you see me years down the road or whatever, 
um, feel free to, yes, say hi. And if I don't recognize you right away, just say, oh, I was in your class, Sochao 3, what's up to? Um, and I'm, I mean that, I want to hear from you. Um, so from all of us, thank you. This has been my favorite year teaching. And again, you know, I have a lot, you know, I'm not always happy, um, but I always really look forward to this class. Um, and, I, and I mean that. Um, and so if there's anything going on in your life, you want to chat, anything, just honestly, open book. Um, feel free to use me as a resource. Talking about resources, resource extraction. And it's not extraction for me. It's an equitable relationship because I like talking to you guys. Anyway, um, have a fantastic um, week and tutorials. And I'll see you at the exam if I don't see you anytime before.